Welcome to The Whole Ecology, a show about everything. I'm here with Dr. Nightingale, a physics professor at URI. Peter's going to start by filling us in on what the current situation is. So what is the state of affairs as far as global warming is concerned? Last year, 2014, was the 38th year in a row where temperatures were above average. Well, the probability of something like that happening 38 times in a row is like um, playing a game of heads and tails and throwing 38 heads one after the other. Um, everybody can sort of realize that that's not particularly likely to, to put it mildly. So uh, the whole issue of climate change, whether it is or is not happening, that's been settled totally. Um, but even though it's been settled that it is happening, there are still people out there who claim that it's not humans who are doing it, and therefore they have an excuse not to do anything about it. Yeah, we've actually known about this for a long time. Uh, during the, industri the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the greenhouse gas effect was originally identified, and uh, Dr. Hansen uh, from NASA, the Goddard Institute, testified in front of Congress. And that, yeah, that's correct. Um, he indeed did. And at the time, that made an enormous impression. And people, it looked as if we were going to deal with this problem. And then we actually didn't. And it got to the point during the, the Bush administration that uh, James Hansen was basically told that he couldn't speak to anybody without the approval of NASA. Well, and at the same time, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the, the, the reasons for existing of NASA, namely to protect the Earth, uh, all of a sudden mysteriously disappeared from their mission statement. So rather than acting on what James Hansen testified, we ran in the opposite direction, and we still are, if you ask me. Well, that direction um, we can see is... Uh, coming at a time when our government institutions are biased toward uh, corporate interest. And uh, one of the things that is coming up here is the um, Algonquin Pipeline expansion in Barrelville. And you've been on record, as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> as a matter of record, we're uh, sitting in in uh, Senator Whitehouse's office arguing that it is not a bridge fuel, that gas is not a bridge fuel, rather it's a bridge fuel to nowhere. Absolutely. Um, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, there was one case that comes to mind when you talk about the, um, the bribery and the fact that the, uh, the various institutions should, that should be taking care of the environment, that they've been captured by precisely the corporations that they're trying to regulate. Uh, there's the famous case, and I'm not precisely sure when this happened, um, 2005, 2006, something like that, maybe a little later, uh, that it was discovered. But uh, this is the, um, the MMS, one of those alphabet soup organizations, uh, the Mineral Ma Minerals Management Service. Um, they were found to have accepted all sorts of, of favors, sexual favors, drugs, trinkets, uh, all sorts of bribes from precisely the company that they were supposed to regulate. And to add a little to that, uh, it's perhaps good to know that the MMS is precisely the, the agency that was regulating uh, British Petroleum, BP, the ones that are well known from their disaster in the Gulf, the uh, deep water horizon that exploded. So, I mean, do you need any proof that, that these organizations have been captured? I don't think so. The Obama administration has a plan, quote unquote, to deal with climate change. And it is to, um, to switch uh, electricity generation from coal to natural gas. And the way they presented it is extremely dishonest. Um, in in the, uh, the climate plan that 
Obama submitted, I think it was not the previous summer, but the one summer before, um, there was the statement that in burning methane, you get twice as much energy per unit carbon emission as when you burn coal. And that's correct. But that's a half-truth if there ever was one. Because what you need to do is you need to take into account the whole life cycle of getting of the fracking, the wellheads, the transportation through a system that's old and that leaks, and then see what happens. And it turns out that investigators in Cornell found out that actually if you take all of that into account, that um, natural gas in terms of its effect on the environment, in particular with respect to, uh, to global warming, is worth for, no matter what you do with it, it's worse than coal and oil. And so the switch that we're making is totally fake. It's uh, rather than helping us, it's as a matter of fact hurting us. Although it's true that in terms of, of other effects, that are associated with coal, perhaps gas is an advantage. But if we're talking exclusively about climate change, natural gas is a bridge, bridge to nowhere. It's actually a bridge backwards. Mm. And uh, why don't we just take a break at this point and we can watch a, uh, a little film that was put together about the placement of the uh, uh, compressor station uh, in uh, New York that's near uh, the uh, Indian Point power plant. Uh, so we're going to cut to that uh, film and we'll uh, be back to discuss that. Governor Cuomo has banned fracking in New York, and that's a pretty remarkable thing. But unfortunately, it's not the whole thing. The infrastructure for moving fracked gas from Pennsylvania to export terminals on the Atlantic coast continues at full tilt. And for people along the route of the proposed pipelines and compressor stations, significant threats remain. For example, in Westchester County, an aging nuclear power plant called Indian Point sits alongside the Hudson River. Two seismic fault lines lie close by, and 40 years worth of highly radioactive spent fuel rods are stored on site. Now the gas industry and pipeline construction companies want to expand an existing pipeline by installing a high pressure 42 inch diameter pipeline right next to Indian Point. Think about that for a minute. A giant gas pipeline next to an aging nuclear power plant that sits near two seismic fault lines. Sometimes common sense eludes even the most dedicated public officials and government agencies who oversee these activities. That's when ordinary citizens and their elected officials need to step in and say, wait a minute. This is one of those times. If you think gas pipelines don't belong next to nuclear power plants, or in our backyards, near our schoolyards, or in other places where we live and play, if you think building out a multi-billion dollar infrastructure to export fossil fuels around the world isn't the best way to address our global energy issues, and if you think that the health of people living in communities near pipelines and compressor stations is just as important as the health of people living near fracking operations, help us push the pause button. That's the button that tells our public officials and government agencies, we don't think this is a good idea. Please look at this again. We have the power to stop this massive build out of pipeline infrastructure, but we need to work together we need the help of our elected officials, and we need to act right now. Join the thousands of people who are helping push the pause button by picking up their phone and calling. Because future generations can't afford for us to wait. What do you think the regional impact 
of this expansion uh, of this pipeline would be? Well, there, there are all sorts of problems um, associated with natural gas. Uh, there is the problem that there is radioactivity in the gas. Uh, we don't know what that does, and there needs to... The fact that you don't know that it's damaging for X, Y, and Z doesn't mean that it's safe. Uh, we've, because all the, the, corp, all the uh, agencies have been captured by the corporations, they consider them to be their clients and they're working for the corporations. They should be working for the people, they're not. So the fact that I can't prove that some house in Burlville is going to be showered by radioactivity is enough for them to say, well, it's not a problem. And you don't have to be a scientist to understand that you don't get into this kind of stuff unless you really, really know that it's not going to do any damage. And so in that sense, we live in an upside down world where the proof is put on the people to show that it's damaging, while the proof is with the government and the regulating agencies to show that this is safe. So there is radon in there, radioactive gas. There are all sorts of other pollutants that cause asthma. Well, can I find somebody in Burlville who, is, who can prove that this person's asthma is caused by the Burlville compressor station? No, obviously not. There are no fingerprints. But you can see that the incidence of asthma claims has gone up in Burlville. So yes, there are indications that something is very likely wrong there. And that simple fact should be enough to say, we're not going to do an experiment with the health of the people in Burlville. That, that's common sense, except in, in the upside down world written by corporate America. Um, then there is the other thing, what is in Burlville does not stay in Burlville. So there is the whole process of the fracking that happens in Pennsylvania, where people who live near the fracking wells get showered by all the chemicals that are being used until finally the methane that escapes in Burlville, the carbon dioxide that escapes all over the place. It's a global problem. What we're doing here will travel across the globe and ultimately it will drown people in the, in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, wow. From Rhode Island to the Philippines, huh? That's quite a, uh, a bit of ground we covered there. Um, you mentioned uh, about tracking one particular incident. It reminds me of the uh, problems uh, of fighting the tobacco industry, where they were able to uh, basically take what anybody knew was that you were getting sick from smoking. All you had to do was try it to feel it, but they were able to postpone that for uh, 20 years. And it was cheaper for them uh, to have these lawsuits. However, um, in Oregon, uh, and Mary Christina Wood, is that? Yeah, yeah that's her name. Um, uh, had written about that. So talk about hope as far as a tactic that we can take to kind of change things. Well, there have been um, lawsuits filed against the government, against um, governors of states, against a whole scala of, of people claiming that the policy that we're following is destroying not just our environment, but the, the environment of generations to come. And um, the way we should see our government is as the trustee that is responsible for keeping the environment safe for the current generation and for future generations. It's sort of like this is our capital that we have in the bank. And we, yes, we can use the interest, but we can't eat up the capital because the capital is what will keep alive future generations. So there, there have been- What you're talking about there is the public trust doctrine. Precisely. Which uh, basically goes back to the whole history of law, uh, Roman law, Greek law, Absolutely. Uh, the Magna Carta, all the basic things that give the government the power to rule. Uh, I would say it's, it's their duty to protect the trust. And they have the power if they, if they want to use it. But they are completely, 
negligent in, in their job and they've sold out to the corporations rather than being trustees. They are serfs to the corporations. And we saw this negligence uh, on display in uh, the PUC hearings just uh, recently uh, where they were um, audacious enough to say that the law made them, gave them the power to protect the profits of uh, Spectra Energy uh, and uh, the profits of uh, National Grid. Um, and at one point I remember the was said that uh, I can't have, we can't have National Grid who made $3.5 billion last year going bankrupt. Could you talk about the uh, uh, power generation issue uh, and how that was corrupted and how that relates to this? Well, this particular case, you, you hear spokespeople for the PUC and the PUC should represent the people. Uh, but you hear them come up with the same argument that National Grid comes up with to justify more pipelines, more pipelines, more pipelines, and more dependence on fossil fuel. They do precisely the opposite of what they should be doing. They should be working for the people, not for the corporations. And well, National Grid is actually an interesting case because I would argue that we fought uh, or the United States, I wasn't here then, <laughs> nor were you, but we fought a war of independence because we had to pay taxes to the Queen in England. Now we have a corporation that is run out of this same Great Britain, not necessarily by the Queen, but one could say... She's a major stockholder. She, she indeed is, yes. And all of a sudden, because this fits into our modern view on capitalism, this is okay. There is no no accountability, no way to regulate it, and we even have to be concerned if they go bankrupt. As far as I'm concerned, they should go bankrupt, and what we should be doing is we should have local generation, green generation, with water, wind, and sun. And these, the technology exists, but it's not being used because the government is doing the bidding for the corporations. They're keeping fossil fuels around for another five years, another 10 years. It'll run out ultimately, but this is very valuable time. And Jim Hansen actually, in one of those lawsuits that we were talking about, um, what are they called? ATL, Atmospheric Trust Litigation. In other words, the argument is the atmosphere is an asset that belongs to the current and previous generations. He testified and said, we have to start doing something now. And what that means is we have to cut down on emissions as of this year by 7% globally. Now that doesn't take into account the fact that we, that is the industrialized world, are the ones that cause the problem. We should be paying more of the price than others who haven't, don't have the benefits, don't have the concrete buildings all over the place that have caused a lot of the emissions we should be cutting more back than the 7%. But that's a separate issue. Instead of cutting back by 7% per year, increases are, and this is true, it has been for the last 150, 200 years, emissions, carbon emissions have increased 2.5% per year. And that's still true. So we're running backwards. <laughs> Uh, just staying on the uh, uh, the PUC uh, issue for 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 a minute, um, that ra right now uh, Rhode Islanders are paying uh, more uh, 25 24 percent spread over uh, over six months uh, and less, uh, but still a lot more, uh, close to a 14% increase for business at a time where all the discussions are about increasing uh, the business, the commerce in, uh, in Rhode Island. But there is another plan. Uh, one was put out by Stanford called the Solutions Project. 
Um, yes, the Solutions Project is something that started, I think it was a collaboration between um, Stanford and Cornell University. And basically they came up originally with a plan uh, to put New York State on energy gained from uh, water, sun and wind. And that they worked out the details and then that grew and it grew into a 50 state plan and one of the plans you can look it up I don't know the details and they don't really matter at this point but there is a plan for Rhode Island how we should do that and the important thing is that it, that a lot of of the way in which this kind of generi uh, energy is generated will be distributed you can have solar panels on your house and feed it into the grid and rather than having this corporation run out of out of Great Britain tell us London, what we do, yeah. uh, we could be the ones who are in charge. And that's, of course, one of the things that corporate America really doesn't want to see. This is what's happening in Germany. Uh, uh, it's clear. People, they've done the experiment. Let's just talk about Hamburg uh, as an example, because Hamburg uh, reacted to austerity, uh, which is basically what we're talking about here, um, in a different way than the rest of Germany. Um, well, there, there are several places in Germany, several, several municipalities, and they followed different tactics uh, when people started talking about austerity. Some of them sold their grid to corporations and others kept them as public utilities. And so Germany decided to do something uh, about global warming and start generating, well, they did away, of course, with their nuclear energy, and so they had to do something to replace that. It turns out that if you see who are successful in this and who make the most rapid progress, it's precisely the municipalities that have kept everything as pub public utilities that are making much quicker progress than uh, the other ones that have sold it. So it, it goes completely opposite to the neoliberal philosophy that private is much more efficient than public. It's not at all true. Because they were able to uh, stabilize the cost of energy, which, was, uh, uh, which is a big part of manufacturing. And uh, Gina Raimondo was talking about uh, this uh, manufacturing renaissance and uh, bringing these jobs back, and this is a way to, uh, to stabilize it. How did you first come across uh, Dr. Howard's studies? Um, well, I came across these matters a long time ago because I have friends uh, in Ithaca where Cornell University is, and he works for Cornell University. And um, so I was aware of, of gas and upstate New York for quite a while. And then I followed it because friends of mine actually sent me links over the last decade at least. And so I was aware that they, they were concerned about it. And then, um, as a matter of fact, I found out what Howarth was doing. And I read his papers. In 2011, they published a paper that said that gas was worse than coal and oil. People tried to shoot it down. They were not successful. Others corroborated the results. And the Howarth group with Ingrafia uh, did more work and they found that all their initial estimates were correct and that the result is simply that it's worse than gas and oil no matter what you do with it. Um, maybe brushing your teeth they might have not considered but, um, but for anything else it's worse. And so in Gasland 2 uh, he actually is being interviewed and he explains that the, the government is going ahead with this plan based on really bad science. Two words on everyone's mind, climate change. I don't think we live in times that uh, are particularly kind to objective information. Well, the hypothesis here is shale gas is better for global warming than other fossil fuels and it's a good transitional fuel. So we, we tested that and the answer is well, no, it's not. The White House has clearly bought into this idea that natural gas is part of the solution to moving us gradually off of fossil fuels. 
Uh, I don't think they did that with good science. We estimate that somewhere between uh, 3.6 and 7.9 percent of the total amount of gas produced over a lifetime of a well is emitted to the atmosphere as methane. There's a continual leakage at the wellhead. There's a leakage from the storage and processing facilities. Purposeful venting also accidental leaks. They throw it into the pipeline systems and the distribution systems and storage systems. There's leakage in all of those. Global warming is caused by greenhouse gases emitted from fossil fuel burning. When you burn coal, you get a lot of CO2. When you burn natural gas, you get about half as much. But methane is the second most important greenhouse gas, and it's 105 times more potent at trapping heat in the short 20-year time frame. Bob Howarth's research shows when you add up the methane escaping into the atmosphere, the fugitive emissions, and the CO2 from frac gas, it makes it the worst fuel for global warming. Uh, there's only one planet. You know, we're doing the experiment now of how global warming is going to work. We're sitting in this bowl. You know, there's, we're down here at the bottom, and the climate goes back and forth within some regime year by year. The worry is that in warming, you're going to switch up and go over into some other bowl over here, and you'll have a dramatically different planet. And that once you switched from this stable regime over to there, there's no easy way to get back. You don't suddenly start reducing your greenhouse gas emissions and go back up over this hill, back to the way things used to be. You're over there in, in a new universe. If you believe that we might be approaching a tipping point over the next couple of decades, then you need to be really careful about pumping methane, it's such a potent greenhouse gas in this short time frame, in, into the atmosphere. Frank Finnan, a woodworker near Dimmick, surrounded by gas wells, bought a FLIR camera, a camera that can see methane undetectable to the naked eye. When I heard that for the first time, I said, who is this guy? He bought a FLIR camera? Is he out of his mind? Yeah, I was. That... I was out of mind. <clears throat> Things like this will put you out of your mind. He started to discover what Bob Howarth had calculated. Methane exploding into the air in huge clouds out of fracking sites. And America, to me, was like Disneyland compared to the rest of the world. And now it's not anymore. For some people, it still is. For some people, we're just a story in the news. You know, I'm a woodworker. Why does a woodworker have all this equipment? So don't, don't tell me this is not your job. Yeah. Step out of your box. Um, go where you've never been before. Yeah. The, the, the times have changed. One night, I went out with him, but this time, we didn't need the clear camera. Go in your hand. Huh? Just don't breathe. Whoa, that one just, see that one just went out. Shooting methane up in the air. Oh, dude, it's right behind somebody's house. This is what Bob was talking about. Methane venting straight up into the atmosphere. There had to be a better way. And this is uh, something that uh, actually resulted in the government doing something right using uh, home rule laws. Uh, fracking was banned in, uh, in New York. So it is worthwhile to keep up on top of that. How do you feel about that? I feel really good about that, as a matter of fact, because if I've read the report for the most part. And they are doing precisely what I think they should be doing. They say... There, the indications about fracking are bad. We don't have solid proof that it's really bad, but it doesn't look good. And simply because we don't know that it's safe, we're not going to go ahead with this. And that's precisely what, what we should be doing. Not turning things upside down and making the people prove that it's wrong, but make the companies prove that it's safe. And that's precisely what they did. And this gets back to what you were talking about that we can do in Rhode Island to uh, reverse the trend of uh, government protecting private interest over public interest and making them do the job that they were put there for. Absolutely. Well, I think that we are out of time. So I want to thank you all uh, for joining us on The Whole Ecology. I want to thank uh, Dr. Nightingale for coming down and uh, visiting with us and um, hope that you uh, bring a little more ecology into your life. Thank you very much and have a great day or night. <laughs> <laughs>